before working with me, they would say, you know, this equipment makes the surgeries go 30% faster. Do you want one doc? I don't know why we're not selling more. It's so logical. And then I said, well, first of all, people make decisions emotionally and then back it up with logic. And so I asked them several questions, taught them the structure that I teach on what makes a good story, which we'll get into in a minute if you're interested. Um, but now they tell this story. Imagine how happy Dr. Higgins was when he could go out to the patient's family in the waiting room an hour earlier than expected. And if you've ever waited for someone you love to come out of surgery, you know every minute feels like an hour. And he put them out of their waiting misery and said, good news, the scope shows they don't have cancer. They're going to be fine. And then turned to the rep and said, you know, this is why I became a doctor for moments like this. Now that rep tells that case story instead of the stat of 30% faster to another doctor at another hospital. And here's the secret, Ben. You're listening to the Real Business Connections Network. Real Business Connections Network. Powered, powered, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. Subscribe now and check us out at realbusinessconnections.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome everyone to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. If you love to learn, be inspired, and succeed, we're here to speak and teach. I'm your host, Ben Albert. I believe if you're not living, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're withering. And if you're not engaged, you can turn this off right now. Because we here at LST are lifelong learners. And listen, I'm not your guru. I'm an ordinary guy on a journey to learn from the experts. My goal is to host each conversation with a beginner's mindset. Learn and let the experts speak and teach their truths. Join us. Oh yeah, and don't forget to subscribe. This episode is brought to you completely free. Get some stake in the game here. My fee for the show only takes a few moments. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Bonus points. Please leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right, let's get started. Hello and welcome everyone to Learn, Speak, Teach on the Real Business Connections Network. I'm here today with John Livesey. John, hey. what's ben. up? How are you? I'm great, Ben. Great to be with you. Some people call you the pitch whisperer. They do. Do you want to hear the story of how that happened? Yes, sir. <laughs> I was giving a talk to Anthem Insurance and before they hired me, they were looking at another speaker and they were trying to decide which one was going to be a better fit. And they happened to mention that after the speaker, um, they were going to have an improvisation session and the audience would shout out objections and people would be on stage role playing. And I said, well, what if I stayed after my talk and would whisper in someone's ear because improvisation is all about yes and and keeping things going. And if somebody gets stuck, I could whisper something from my talk in their ear and they said, oh, that'd be great. And it went so well that someone said, oh, I wish you could always be in my ear. You really are the pitch whisperer. Mm. And I told that story to Inc. Magazine and they put it in press and now it's been trademarked and registered and all that fun stuff. Love it. I, one thing you just mentioned, I have this attached to my TV here. Yes. And ah, wonderful. What a great reminder that I am on your side and I'm on the audience side. So I want to give them a very brief synopsis and then we're going to dive way deeper than this. Um, John Livesey is a sales keynote speaker. You're an author of the sale is in the tale as seen behind John in the video mm -hmm. version here today, along with several other incredible books, host of the successful pitch podcast, I notice you've had Kevin Harrington on, Robert Cialdini, so many great experts on persuasion, storytelling, and sales. Um, you're an expert in sales, marketing, persuasion, negotiation, storytelling, meeting planning, and more. I noticed this lit me up. I saw that you were recognized and interviewed by Larry King and Cal Fussman, and yeah. that lit me up because Larry King is one of my favorite interviewers of all time, uh -huh. and Cal Fussman a lot of people don't know him. That's in the show notes. Google Cal Fussman. To me, he's one of my favorite storytellers of all time. So the fact those gentlemen recognized you is great. 
Um, but I can't imagine it wasn't always like this. You weren't, you know, <laughs> you weren't on a magic carpet ride talking to these big shots your whole life. Tell me a little bit about what got you to that level that you're at today, John. Well, the Larry King interview with Cal Busman was something that was not even on the bucket list or the wish list. You know, we all set these big, hairy, audacious goals. Mm -hmm. Watching Larry King on TV as a kid interview celebrities and presidents and stuff, I never thought to myself, someday I'm going to get that to happen to me. So no, that, um, that came about through someone introducing me to Cal Fussman, Cal and I becoming friends. His son wanted to get into sales. Cal is also a keynote speaker and wanted some help going from journalists to selling himself as a speaker. Mm -hmm. And I gave him some tips on how storytelling skills as a journalist could be applied to selling himself as a speaker. And after that, he said, you know, I'm hosting, co-hosting a show with Larry King called Breakfast with Larry, and um, we'd like to have you on. So it was a complete thrill. Um, and Larry King preparing for that was huge because if you have a hint of the imposter syndrome uh, come up, you will be horrible. And so I did all the much research as I could on Larry King. And I found out that he does not like small talk. Mm -hmm. And um, we literally had breakfast at this diner. And then we get into his car with his driver and um, we go to his studio and on the way he and Cal are in the back listening to a ball game. And Larry was a big Dodger fan and Cal's trying to pull me into the conversation kindly and saying, Oh, are Johnny, you into sports. And there was a minute Ben where I had to say, don't do it. Don't pretend you are. Cause you know, you're not. I said, not <laughs> really. I'm an advertising guy. I used to watch the Super Bowl for the commercials, not the game. And they kind of laughed. So by the time I was on air with Larry and Cal, and he said, how important is it to be authentic when you tell a story? I said, oh, it's everything. In other words, if you don't know sports, don't pretend that you do. And so yeah. that really set the tone for a great experience and an interview. But even before that, I, you know, had a passion for what motivates people. How do you get people to change their behavior? I actually majored in advertising and um, worked for an ad agency for a while where we would take movies that had been uh, out in the theaters and had to be promoted to go on video back in the days when Blockbuster and all that was around. And I learned a lot about storytelling because if the movie hadn't done well in the movie theaters, we could re-edit it and make it a different story to get people to want to rent or buy it. Um, and then I had a 15 year career selling advertising for Condé Nast, big brands like W and Vogue and GQ and Wired, and Arc Digest. Um, and that's really where I started my speaking career. I would start speaking to our clients, sales teams like Alexis. Uh, I would speak to their car company salespeople about how to tell a story and how to sell the luxury market. And more importantly, how to not take rejection personally so that when I was working at Connie Nass is when I wrote my first book now, 18 years ago. And um, that's what started my own journey of, oh, I would really like to have that career. And so I've been doing that for the last uh, seven years now. Love it. So you're, you're in sales, specifically in the advertising space. Now we'll just do two generic examples. So most people know who Tony Robbins is. Yes. Most people know what a Ferrari is. Yes. So imagine you're selling Tony prod Tony Robbins products, mm -hmm. or you're selling a Ferrari. It's very easy to call up and and people know the brand, they know the name. So you right. just start spitting out features and benefits because you're so excited mm -hmm. about all these great things that Tony has accomplished and how quick that car can go and how sleek and beautiful <laughs> it is, how great it looks on camera. At what point did you? realize that the sale was in the tail at what point did you realize that the storytelling worked because in my my i'm thinking if someone called me up and wanted to sell me tony robbins i wouldn't really need a story i already know who he is at what point did you realize that even in a scenario like that the sale right. was in the tail well when i was calling on lexus they said you know we looked at 20 magazines we've narrowed it down to 10 we're only going to run in three but we're going to let each rep from the 10 magazines come in for 30 minutes and pitch back to back to back. Do not talk about numbers. We've already analyzed that. That's why you're in the final. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Most of the reps were like a deer in headlights. I can't talk about circulation and income of my readers. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And I realized that it was whoever told the best story about the merchandise and marketing ideas and why this audience was perfect to respond to the launch of that new vehicle would be the one that would get the advertising. And that really was my aha moment. And then I realized I learned how to tell stories from being in the advertising business and editing a, a movie differently. So I combined those two things and that really is what allowed me to win salesperson of the year at Condé Nast, but not before I was laid off. I was laid off in 2008 when the mortgage crisis hit mm. along with a lot of other people in advertising. And I had to reinvent myself and learn how to sell digital and not just print. And it was almost like what happened to actors in the Hollywood days when silent movies, some made it to talkies and some didn't. And that was my aha moment as an entrepreneur going, I've got to continually learn new skills in order to stay relevant. And um, I ended up giving a TEDx talk called Be the Lifeguard of Your Own Life uh, based on that whole experience of being laid off and having to reinvent myself. Um, and then two years after selling digital ads, I got rehired by Condé Nast and one salesperson of the year. And I thought, I'm the same person whether I'm getting laid off or winning this award. And that really became my mission is to help as many people as possible get off what I call the self-esteem roller coaster, where you only feel good about yourself if things are going well and bad if they're not. And when we really transcend that and realize that our identity is bigger than any one thing happening to us, that's when we're really free. And so our identity is way bigger than just one thing. We, <laughs> all, we all are unique. Who is John? I'm not going to be exactly like you, nor is any, oh. neither of us are ex exactly cut from the exact same cloth. So who's John and how are you so resilient going from role to role, potentially reinventing your career, but staying mm -hmm. in integrity of who you are? Who's John? Who's John at the core? I would say at the core, my three big values are integrity, passion, and joy. And it's my compass. Uh, and the people I'm working with have integrity. Do they do what they say they're going to do? Am I doing what I'm saying I'm going to do? Um, am I passionate about this? And is it bringing me or somebody else joy? And if all three are yes, then I proceed. So that's how I decide what uh, works for me. Passion, integrity, and joy. I love that because my my top three are growth, connection, and fun, mm -hmm. which you've got joy, I've got fun, same category there. Yes. Give us a story or a scenario where you are living in alignment with those values. Like when does that come up? Because I find my proudest moments are when I'm living in alignment with connection, growth, and fun. So passion, integrity, joy, what's a story yes. or, or a case study of that that occurring for you? Yeah. Well, when Olympus Medical, the camera company has a medical division um, and they hired me right before the pandemic to speak in April of 2020 at their live event. And then, of course, the pandemic happened in March and they said, well, we're obviously not having a live event. We want to keep the commitment we have to you, but we have to figure out a way to resell what we're doing and the fee that you're doing it at for it to be virtual instead of in person. So we were both committed to honoring our word of what we agreed to do. And then the creativity and the passion that came out of, well, what could you do to provide additional value um, since the talk is going to be virtual? And it turns out they had a huge need to get the salespeople trained on how to look and sound good on camera. If you go back in time, you know, a couple of years, you know, everything was on back order. People were sitting in front of a window, you know, the people are uncomfortable on camera. Uh, they've never sold on camera. So I having, you know, been interviewed on TV a few times had that experience that I could transfer and train their people, not only how to tell better stories, but also how to look and sound good on Zoom with confidence. And that combination brought everybody a lot of joy and has completely impacted their culture now where they have all of the case stories, which is what I say you do instead of a case study mm. um, on a map that allows people to share and um, 
break down silos between divisions. So that's an example of all of those things being in alignment during a stressful time. Love it. So I get together case stories, not case studies. So it's not, hey, my name's Ben and listen to all the great stuff I do and all the things I can do for you. I'm here to help. It's look at these stories of past success from my previous partners and clients and how they got what you want. Yes. That's how it's done. That is. Let's give the listeners an example of that. Yes. Uh, So before working with me, they would say, you know, this equipment makes the surgeries go 30% faster. Do you want one doc? I don't know why we're not selling more. It's so logical. And then I said, well, first of all, people make decisions emotionally and then back it up with logic. And so I asked them several questions, taught them the structure that I teach on what makes a good story, which we'll get into in a minute if you're interested. Um, But now they tell this story. Imagine how happy Dr. Higgins was when he could go out to the patient's family in the waiting room an hour earlier than expected. And if you've ever waited for someone you love to come out of surgery, you know every minute feels like an hour. And he put them out of their waiting misery and said, good news, the scope shows they don't have cancer. They're going to be fine. And then turned to the rep and said, you know, this is why I became a doctor for moments like this. Now that rep tells that case story instead of the stat of 30% faster to another doctor at another hospital. And here's the secret, Ben. When you tell a story like that, that someone sees themselves in, they want to go on the journey with you. And most doctors say, well, that's why I became a doctor. I want your equipment too. And the client said, oh, that gives us chills. Not only are we not telling stories, it never occurred to us to make a patient's family a character in the story. So there's a lot of takeaways from that little story. You notice they're not the hero. The doctor is. Mm-hmm. There's a structure to it. There's the exposition. We know the name of the doctor, what hospital, how long ago. You got to paint the picture, the exposition. The problem is the patient's family. And I even pull you in a little bit by saying, if you've ever waited for someone, and even if you haven't, it, you can imagine it would be torturous. And then the solution is the doctor comes out and puts the patient's family out of their waiting. But the real key to any good story is the resolution. What is life like? after and when that little story has what the doctor says to the rep that's why i became a doctor that's what really makes that story memorable and gets other people to see themselves in it love it so you hinted it sounds like you have a specific framework can we get out our i'm gonna grab my pencil here (laughs) yep grab my pencil it's a big one ready to go yeah i love it People who listen to the audio don't get, I have weird props. I pull up all the time it's and fun. I love a prop. it off. So watch the video. I'm going <laughs> to pass you the mic though, John, what is this framework? Where should I start? Presume I'm a beginner yep. and I'm looking to make, tell great stories in stories. my marketing copy, in yep. my presentations. Where, where do I start? First step is the exposition. Think of yourself like a journalist. Mm -hmm. who, what, where, when, get specific with the details. The second step is the problem. And here's the secret, Ben. The better you describe the problem and show empathy, the more people think you have their solution. Then the third step is the solution. And the fourth step, as I mentioned, is called the resolution. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the Wizard of Oz ended when Dorothy got in the balloon, the end. But no, there's that wonderful scene where she's at home, in bed and saying, oh, there's no place like home and you were there. That's the resolution. That's why that story is such a classic. So we understand some of the tangible elements, but one thing, so you're a big personality and you use different tone of voice and you phrase your stories a certain way. Like what happens if one, we feel like we're not a good storyteller or even Uh worse, people start to glaze over. Are there nuanced things that I should know about? Is there triggers that I'm telling a poor story? I know I'm asking (laughs) like five questions at once, but what if people glaze over? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Well, let's start with the good news is you don't have to be born a gifted storyteller. You can learn it. It's Mm -hmm. not like becoming a star athlete for the Olympics or, uh, you know, Meryl Streep in acting or something. Um, As you continue to practice your skill, like any skill, riding a bike, learning how to drive stick shift, whatever it is, um, you can get better and better at it. Now, I have a little checklist for everybody to have as an internal monitor and also when they're practicing with other people before they tell the story. It's the three C's. 
First C is, is it clear? If it's not clear and you confuse people, they're gonna always say no. The next, is it concise? Why does it need to be concise? And that's, if it goes on and on and on, that's when people glaze over. Mm. The reason it needs to be concise is so they can remember it and repeat it then to other people. And that's how they become your brand ambassadors because clients will hear many, many pitches and then they all have another meeting after the meeting and say, well, what'd you think? They all sound the same. Let's just go with the cheapest. Or I remember the story Ben told me about ba ba ba. And I think that's, uh, that's why we should go with him. And then finally, is it compelling? Does it tug at the heartstrings to get people to open the purse strings? I like this. It's I ran in my first ever sales role. I found the golden ticket question for a follow up. Mm -hmm. And it would be, you know, John, I know you have to talk to Lisa. What are you going to tell her nice. you know, about this product and service? Well, what are you going to say? Yeah. And I got the golden ticket question for follow up. You know, what would happen when I asked that question is they didn't even really know what I was talking about the half to, it's, yeah. it, it was going over their head. Wow. And I had this great question for follow up. But if I didn't leave them anything tangible to yeah. actually, so John doesn't have anything to tell Lisa because he glazed over during my yeah. presentation, there's no perfect question to solve that issue. So have you always been good at this? Where have you gained this knowledge? I'd love to hear a time that you fell on your face. <laughs> if you're, if you're sure. willing to, but, but I'm just wondering where you yeah. gained this, this knowledge. Well, I'll, I'll first tell you one of the many times I've fallen on my face. I mean, I'm the kind of guy that was at a stationary bike at the gym and was trying to impress somebody and was talking to them next to me. And I leaned over and I thought the bike was in fact, you know, bolted to the ground turns out it wasn't <laughs> I fell over on the floor while trying to impress somebody at the gym so i i think i'm the only person i know who's ever fallen off a bike going nowhere um so that's just my personality to begin with um the years ago i had a boss um i've had many great bosses but this one and he and i just didn't click and um we had a meeting at nordstrom's in seattle i was flying from la he was flying from new york monday morning 9 a.m fly in there on sunday um, I confirm everything Friday. We get there. The person says, oh, I'm so sorry. The VP you were supposed to meet had an emergency meeting. You'll be meeting with a junior executive. He was livid. Why didn't you confirm this appointment? I'm like, I did. there was nothing I could say, right? I flew all this way. I did not to meet with a junior person, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh God. <sighs> and then we get in this conference room and it's the size of a closet. You pull your chair out, you hit the wall. I mean, it could not have been more depressing and more, you know, and he goes, just go through the presentation fast. Nobody cares. This person can't make any decisions. And um, I, the room was so small that the, the uh, image projection was kind of blurry, which didn't matter because mostly it was images, but there was one had that had a quote from a, another store on there, but I never memorized it because I could always read it before. And in this case, I couldn't. And he goes, go back and read that quote. I was like, oh my God, it was just one disaster after another. And mm -hmm. um, I thought I was going to get fired for sure from that. But uh, yeah, so no, I don't think a baseball player always hits a home run and a, a salesperson doesn't always hit a home run. Here's what I've learned being rejected so many times is the key to rejection is to never reject yourself or what you're selling. Because when I would get a no from someone, I'd be like, well, maybe another rep could have gotten a yes. Or maybe they're right. Another brand is better than my brand. And I'm like, don't do that to yourself. So no now me doesn't mean no forever. And it also doesn't mean that you have to agree with the rejection. So when you don't reject your own skill and your, what you're selling, um, I have recommended many of my clients to call someone that they did sell something to. Kind of like, you know, when you go to a fancy restaurant, they give you sorbet in between courses to cleanse your palate. Okay. We need to cleanse our palate mentally when we've gotten a no and go, you know what? I'm going to call somebody, let's say you're selling cars again, who I sold a car to last week, just to see how they're enjoying it. Just to remember what that sounds like and feels like and the energy of that before the next person walks into the showroom or I pick up the phone to make a call. Otherwise you carry the negativity with you. 
Right. And that person who walked into the showroom and rejected you, there's probably a whole slew of reasons that they didn't purchase from you. It could have nothing to do with it. So don't reject the product. Don't reject yourself. Exactly. Bet on yourself. Put your chips on yourself. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like if you put your chips on your storytelling skills, yes. there's a higher probability that you'll have more success. Down the You're road. Uh, so right, Ben. In fact, my whole um, formula for this is soft skills make us strong. And again, your brain goes, wait, how can something soft make me strong? But if you're an architect or a lawyer or financial advisor, you have all the hard skills, but so does everybody else. And that's why you are basically drowning in a sea of sameness, unless you figure out a way to stand out with a story. So the soft skills, listening, showing that empathy I talked about, and then finally adding storytelling to the mix. Those three things give you the emotional connection that's necessary to get a yes. Love it. So I'm looking to implement immediately. <laughs> I'm wondering, and I'm sure the listener is as well, where should I start finding these stories? Oh, okay. Where do they well, come from? I'm, I'm like, not going to just make up a story using your no, framework. No. I'm sure I could, yeah. but that's not living in authenticity. Right. Where can each individual knowing that it'll be unique to them, mm -hmm. find these stories in their Well, lives. let's start with there's three types of stories. There's your own personal story of origin. How did you get into this business? What made you sell cars, insurance, become an architect, whatever it is. Have that person. I remember working with an architecture firm. I helped them win a billion dollar airport renovation against two competitors. And we worked on the story of origin that the team was saying. And one guy said, you know, I was 11 years old. I played with Legos. Now I have a son that's 11. I still play with Legos with him. I still have that same passion I did as a kid for architecture. And I'm going to bring that to this project. Well, that's personal, memorable. That's, you know, so craft your own story of origin. Mm. And then the second story you need to craft is your own company story. I don't care if you're a one person company, you have a name of your company. Ideally, your company has some values, things you stand for. Um, I remember uh, when I spoke at the Coca-Cola um, summit as their keynote speaker, uh, I interviewed Auntie Anne's pretzels CMO. And I said, how did this all start? Oh, well, she sold pretzels at a farmer's market to begin with. And now it's in malls and airports. Wow. And I, you know, that's a rags to riches story for the company. And then after you do that, then the third kind of story is a case story. And the best place to look for those is, people you've sold to, your testimonials. And if you're new, ask your coworkers for their testimonials and you can share other people's case stories until you have your own. Love it. So my personal story, why I do what I do, mm -hmm. company story, what's the reason behind this company? How are we serving you? Yes. And case stories to actually show how that company, your product, your service solution does that for them. Yes. Not to be like waving the flag, look at how cool Ben and John are, but actually illustrate how I'm helping them. Yes, you're basically the Sherpa helping someone climb Mount Everest. And without you, they're going to get lost and frustrated. But with you, they'll get up much faster than they would without you. I love this analogy. I want, I want to know your opinion on this. So who would you rather, who's going to ask better questions? Who's going to elicit the the true response is it going to be an attorney or is it going to be a doctor oh very interesting scenarios there hmm let me think about that i've never and, been asked that question and before. there is a correct answer so <laughs> who's going to um, elicit the best response the best story the best solution i would say the you? doctor probably because you have a sense of trust in them where lawyers, you may not trust as much as a doctor. Yeah, yes, it, it, massively, both very actually, we need big trust in both fields. But the whole reason I bring it up is from my understanding, what I've learned is the attorneys finding a way to meet their agenda mm. when the doctor doesn't have an agenda. Except getting you well, right? They just know. Yeah. The doctor's agenda is making sure that you live long enough to take mm -hmm. your daughter down the aisle when she's yeah. getting married, when the attorney's agenda is 
let's win this case, win, lose, or draw. I want to make a commission on it. Yeah. This is not actually to throw any attorneys or doctors under the bus, but that's how I'm framing it in my head. Mm. So we want to be problem solvers and finders and solution finders and tell stories. It's not for me, it's for them. Correct. And also, we touched on trust. Trust is transferred. That's why warm introductions are so valuable. Recommendations, social proof, all of that. Uh, so that your defenses go down. Love it. So build relationships and connect people. Yes. And continue the conversation. Exactly. Reach out to people. Ask them how they're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, so how are you doing? You're living in Austin, Texas now. I forget why, but I put it in my notes that you're just like goo goo gaga for Austin. You love it there. And I honestly, do. I love it too. Um. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with Austin, why you moved there, how the right. experience has been. Well, my friends think I'm, you know, got some crazy um, magical powers. I moved here March 1st of 2020, two weeks before <laughs> the pandemic started. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and got out of LA uh, where everything shut down much more drastically. Um, I wanted to play, I love the theme of the city, keep it weird. That alone, I thought, oh, this is my kind of place. Um, and the book, The Sale is in the Tale, is a business fable set here in Austin and is my way of uh, giving a love letter to Austin because I mentioned some of my favorite coffee place, Mozart's Cafe by the Lake, and I mentioned, you know, the park I like to go to. And so uh, even though it's a fictional story, the places are real. And um, that's part of the journey of, you know, Austin's been uh, at the top of the list of why people want to move here for several years. And um so you meet really interesting people from all over uh, the country who are, are coming here together, which is very stimulating. How do I? So I actually have the book. So I'm, I sometimes ask questions for everyone. I, I realize yeah. that. So I already have sales in the tale. How does the listener get in on the action and read it? Where, where should we go to, to get the book? Sure. Well, um, depending on how you like to consume content, if you like the audible version, I narrated it. If you want the you know, book in your hand version, um, just go to Amazon or any place that sells books. I got to get the audible version because I have the book in your hand version. Uh, Personally, I love the audio and visual element together. Mm -hmm. I will pay the extra blank to have you read it to me. Uh, what, what, you do corporate speaking, live this, that, yes. all sorts of stuff. Like what, what else are you working on? What, how else can we help you? Well, if a company has, especially if they're in tech or healthcare, that's my sweet spot. And they have an annual meeting coming up and the salespeople are struggling to not feel like they're just seen as a commodity. Then having me come in and speak uh, at the meetings is my number one passion. And I love doing it. And um, the results and the impact are great. Um, I'm also exploring uh, working with Andrew Gray on starting a sort of a uh, new online course for young people about the superhero, uh, is the everyday superhero and helping young people get their confidence and mindset proper um, in order to, uh, you know, interact better. You know, the whole, re we hear of IQ, EQ and RQ, relationship uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, if we use the analogy of superheroes and trying to figure out what your superpower is, um, I think that's going to be a really fun um, way to help people connect. I love that. In a second, we're going to go to the rapid fire round. I'm going to start before we do that. I want a more long form answer on this okay. because the rapid fire is short, sweet answers. And one yep. of the rapid fire questions I actually crossed out because a lot of people would get stumped. So I'm not here to stump you. I actually think you'll have an answer to this one. Okay. I like to ask who is your favorite superhero and or if you were a superhero, who would you be? Oh, interesting. Well, I've always been a Batman fan, even as a kid. I just thought that whole thing of rising from the ashes from such a tragic loss of the parents and the whole Batmobile and all the gadgets and putting the bat sign up in the sky. Um, I've always thought that would be, and the I like the outfit. I like everything about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Um, 
Yeah, and it's interesting now uh, with the project I'm working with Andrew Gray on. He is a superhero, right? He is a superhero. He's really Batman, and I'm more Alfred, the older mentor, which is a wonderful combination where you can... I'm mentoring him, and then together we're going to mentor even younger people than he is. So um, that that that's really fun. That is fun. Let's officially go rapid fire. Short, sweet, easy to answer, no right or wrong answers. You can cross okay. it out, skip whatever you want. I start with coffee or tea. Tea. Are you a morning person? Yes. Let's do social media platform. Where where do you spend most of your time? Because maybe I want to stalk you. I shouldn't Thanks. ask. <laughs> I shouldn't ask questions like that. I apologize. LinkedIn and Instagram. LinkedIn and Instagram, and that'll be in the show notes. Um, favorite guilty pleasure thing that you just love to do that day off, no work. What lights you up? Go see live theater, Broadway musicals. Ooh, any favorite Broadway musicals? I loved Hugh Jackman and Music Man. Music Man, Hugh Jackman. We'll do a couple more long form ones. What's one I haven't asked in a while? Give me one of the most proudest moments, proudest accomplishment, proudest moment of your life. Wow. One of the most proud moments of my life was when I won salesperson of the year at Condé Nast after being laid off two years previous, because I thought to myself, anything's possible. And again, that was never a goal to win that award, not just for the magazine, but for the entire company against 400 other salespeople. So that certainly made me feel like that's the Oscars of advertising sales. I love that. What a proud moment. Congratulations. You're obviously kick butt at what you do. <laughs> we'll do one more slightly longer one. Okay. You and I don't know each other that well yet, at least. What What is a question that only like a business partner, if a business partner were to have a podcast, what would they ask that I just didn't know to ask John? What What would they ask and what would be the answer to that question? What new technique do you have to help people not get stuck in the rejection and the disappointment of life? John, what new technique do you have to not get stuck in the rejection and bitter disappointment of life? Well, what techniques do you have? I have created something I call the five, five, five method. So you get cut off in traffic. Some people get livid over that. Um, but I say, you know, ask yourself, will this matter in five minutes, five hours, five days from now? And zoom out like you're the movie director of your own life. And when you zoom out that far, you'll go, oh, five days from now, that'll just be a distant memory. And why am I going to get so angry over this? Whether it's a no or somebody lets you down or betrayed you. Now, sometimes life is, you know, traumatic. Like when my dad died several years ago, I was traumatized. And I thought, I wish I had this tool in my hand because so five days from now, you're still going to be really upset. Do it again. So how about five weeks, five months, five years from now? And I said, well, five years from now, if I was going back to my younger self, I would say, you're still going to miss him, but I promise you, you won't be this sad. So I have people now saying, oh, I love this. They email me all the time, go, I just five, five, five something that I normally would be so angry about. And I let it go much faster. I love that strategy. Let's end it at that. One more thing, though. The podcast. What's the name again? I know Kevin Harrington's been on. Robert yes. Cialdini's been on. Beautiful storytellers. Well, it's called that? The Successful Pitch with a P. Got to really emphasize that P. Otherwise, someone thinks it's a whole other show. I, I try to plug because the person who does my show notes, I got to make sure that we get it all there. So we put it all in the show notes. But Thank you. this is not about me, guys. Go subscribe to John's podcast. Leave him a review. Shower him with love because he took time out of his tremendously busy day when he could be doing a kick-ass keynote to talk with us. So we appreciate it, John. I thank you for your time and hopefully we'll have you on again sometime soon. And it's been a real pleasure. Thanks again. Thanks again for listening to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. You need to go subscribe if you haven't yet. This show is completely free. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend, 
and explain your favorite part. Leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right. Thanks once more for listening to LST. I am so grateful. Talk to you soon.